This case occurred on November 28, 2014, in London, United Kingdom. Sarah was a 32-year-old London single mother of three children. She had spent several years waiting for a council property. It appeared that the four of them had a rather turbulent past. Yet, in 2014, her family was given an apartment in Silvertown, East London. Alfian and Reese, Sarah's twins who were 11 years old, and Bradley, her oldest child, who was 12 years old, now had a chance to start anew. The changeover initially seemed to be going smoothly, according to Sarah, her children were adjusting to school, and seemed to be enjoying their new life. Everyone was happy and things were going great. Just across from the apartment complex where their family lived was another apartment complex. A 77-year-old man named Michael Pleestead lived there. He was a nice, older gentleman who was kind and didn't cause trouble. Michael would sell newspapers at the local news agency. Michael appeared to get along well with everyone in the area, those who knew him usually stopped to chat. Soon after moving in, Sarah met Michael, and the two quickly became close. They would talk all the time, and sometimes she would even make him meals and bring them over to his apartment. Sarah would have thought Michael was just a nice, kind old man at that point. Sarah was regularly Michael's companion, and was always willing to help. At this point, Bradley, Sarah's son, was 12 years old and looking for a weekend employment that was suitable for his age. Out of pure financial necessity and coincidence, Michael asked Sarah whether her son Bradley would be interested in helping him at the news agencies. Sarah considered Michael as a close friend and someone she could trust. She had no problem with Michael asking about it, and many other young boys in the neighborhood had helped Michael earn some extra pocket money, so she asked her son if he would be interested. Bradley was so excited about it that he jumped at the chance to make some extra money. Bradley soon began assisting with the paper sorting at the shops, and on a few occasions, he brought his twin brothers along as well. Yet soon after starting, Bradley told Sarah he was done working for Michael, and that he would soon tell her the horrifying reason why. Sarah's twin sobbed and told her in November 2014, that they had gone through every parent's worst nightmare. They asserted that Michael invited them back to his flat after helping them sort some of the papers. Because they trusted him, the boys agreed and returned to his house with Michael. Michael engaged the two boys in play when he arrived. Bradley then discovered that Michael had groomed his two siblings. Bradley was tearing his hair out, shaking, and screaming hysterically as Sarah entered his room. Michael had also mistreated him, he admitted to his mother, but he had been too ashamed and terrified to tell anybody else. Bradley suggested that he should have told her sooner. Michael had established a friendship with Sarah in order to gain her trust and gain access to her kids. This was always his plan. Sarah stayed with her boys all night as they described how Michael had mistreated and groomed them. Later, Sarah would say that she was overcome by the intensity of her regret. She insisted that keeping her kids safe was her first priority and expressed her sadness at having let them down. Sarah phoned the police, explained the situation to the detectives, Michael was quickly brought into custody. Even though the story ought to have stopped at this point, it tragically goes on. After filing a not guilty plea and being taken into prison by the police, Michael was promptly freed on bail. He was set free and allowed to go back to his apartment, which was right next to Sarah's home. Because they believed Michael would seek retaliation, her children were very afraid and there was a good chance they may run across Michael as they left the flat. Sarah, who was understandably furious, 
went straight to the police station and requested that Michael be arrested again. She rejected their advice that she should move somewhere else. Sarah moved her three boys to her mother's house since she didn't feel safe there anymore. And they all stayed there for a few days. The community council gave a similar response when Sarah asked them to help her move Michael. They asserted that they could relocate Sarah and the boys' new residences, but they would be outside of London, and worse then, the three boys would be required to testify against Michael at the trial because he had pleaded not guilty. A scary situation for everyone who has experienced such a crime, but children in particular. Sarah thought it was unjust that Michael was still allowed to wander the streets, and that no one was paying any attention to her. A few days later, on November 28, Sarah drank two bottles of wine, left her mother's home alone, and drove herself back to her apartment. She saw images of her three babies on the way back to her apartment and started to sob. She could no longer endure the shame brought on by the abuse her boys endured while in her custody. Sarah got to her feet and went to the kitchen to get a 12-inch knife. She left her block of apartments and walked across to the adjacent block where Michael lived. While she waited for him to answer, Michael opened the door and they began to talk. Sarah pleaded with him to do the right thing and confess to the crimes he had perpetrated so that her kids wouldn't have to relive their suffering in court. Michael responded by claiming that her children were lying and that he was innocent of any wrongdoing. The moment Sarah sent an unconvinced glance his way, Michael's personality shifted. He grew arrogant, rude, and smirked when he saw Sarah didn't believe him. After showing no remorse for the agony he had caused Sarah's children, Sarah later said that she didn't recognize the person she had formerly thought of as her friend. He fought both speaking and confessing to what he had done. Michael yelled and ran towards Sarah as she drew the 12-inch knife. Sarah took out the knife and stabbed Michael numerous times. She stabbed Michael eight times in all before running off. Sarah could be seen escaping the crime scene while carrying the knife on the CCTV footage. Michael was left alone in his apartment and bled to death. An hour after attacking Michael, Sarah turned herself into the police. Insisting that her intention was to persuade Michael to confess to the crimes rather than really murder him, she described the scenario to them and claimed that she had lost all control. After the murder, it was determined that Michael wasn't even his real name. His real name was Robin Malt, but we'll continue to call him Michael for the sake of simplicity. Using his previous name, Michael, he was found guilty of multiple crimes involving S.A. with young boys from 1970 to 1991. He had an astonishing total of 24 prior convictions, with sentences ranging from 9 to 6 years in length. This is where the issue becomes much more disgusting than it currently is. In the UK, there is a legal loophole that allows registered criminals to change their names, receive new driver's licenses, and obtain new passports. No one was aware of Michael's past because he had changed his name, and his offenses were committed before the sex offender's register was created. Michael had been dwelling in an apartment supplied by the council with a view of a primary school. Hundreds of convicts had changed their names without alerting the authorities, according to media reports at the time. Many of them had passed a background check and had experience working with children. The trial began in September 2015. In a statement to the court after the evidence was shown, Sarah explained how she lost control and acted simply out of worry for her children. The judge presiding over the case judged Sarah's predicament to be very remarkable given the awful crimes Michael had committed and the fact that he had been allowed to return to his apartment. Instead of being convicted of murder, Sarah was judged guilty of manslaughter for lack of control. 
Although she was sentenced to three and a half years in prison, an appeal to increase the duration of her sentence was made since some people thought it was an excessively lenient punishment. Sarah sought to avoid leaving any fingerprints and donned clothing to hide her identity from CCTV cameras, which led to the extension of her sentence. She fled the area without asking for assistance after stabbing Michael, showing signs of premeditation. Because of these facts, Sarah's sentence was enhanced to seven years. After serving the first four years of her seven-year sentence, Sarah was released in August 2018. She's free right now. Several people in the community praised Sarah for what she accomplished, and many more praised her in letters they sent to her while she was imprisoned. Others agree with her sentencing and believe she should have allowed the courts handle her case, they also believe they would have acted in a similar manner if they had been in her position. Sarah's children gave up their right to privacy once she was released from prison so they could publicly support their mother. They said that there was some relief in knowing that Michael could no longer harm people. Sarah has given countless interviews after being freed in order to make sure that everyone is aware of her whole version of events. I never imagined I'd be capable, she added. Although I don't take satisfaction in killing him, at least I know that he can no longer harm others. I wouldn't kill again, and I don't see myself as a murderer, but I don't regret what I did since I was a mother desperately trying to defend my children. I've never denied that I should have been punished. What are your thoughts on the Sarah Sands case? Was she correct in her actions? Was the judge correct in giving her a seven-year sentence? Share your thoughts and comments below. And don't forget to like and subscribe and turn notifications on so you don't miss out on any new cases.